Hi, this is Alan Gassman. I welcome you to this program, Sophisticated Charitable Planning and Recent Events Associated Therewith. There's two reasons I've really been looking forward to this program. One is I get to spend some time with my friend, Paul Kasperson, and I get to learn from Paul. Paul is a very bright, very articulate, and very dedicated tax and charitable tax planner. That's what Paul does. That's what Paul lives to do. He's got a fantastic background. He's raised over a billion dollars for just the University of Florida. Now he's available as a consultant, primarily to charities, but also for tax planners who need help on structuring. The second reason that I'm looking forward to this presentation is that Paul's gonna do all the work. I'm just <laughs> gonna sit back for the first hour. This is a one hour continuing education program. If you are a Florida lawyer or Florida CPA, you're gonna get credit for one hour, but we're gonna go past an hour. Once we hit an hour, then I'm gonna play with the state view, the state planning software. So before I introduce Paul, I wanna note that if you have questions, you can go ahead and send them to us by hitting the inverted pyramid, and the inverted pyramid will then allow you to, to put in the question and we will answer it. Secondly, in about four hours, this video will be posted to our YouTube library. You could pretty much just put in Gassman YouTube or Alan Gassman YouTube, and this will come up and you'll see the video. We'll also be emailing you a link to the video. Next, how to access a state view. While you're watching this program, we'll give you a minute towards the, uh, at the end of the 60 minutes, but you can just put estateview.link in your browser. That's the top left-hand side. And then just put in any email address you want. It can be archie at archie.com. And then you could do a password, Veronica, anything you want, a at a.com, password, BCA. Um, and that will bring you into our screen. Then you can click on the left, free until May 1st, or click on the right, pay a dollar. And if you pay a dollar, you'll get two months free if you subscribe, plus fixed pricing. So that's my advertisement for Estate View. Paul, welcome. Here's a wonderful picture of you. It doesn't do you justice. Tell us, <laughs> tell us a little bit about yourself and what I'm what I'm always interested in is what what first ignited your passion for this and and what keeps you passionate about what you do because it's a wonderful thing yes thank you first of all thank you Alan for the invitation to join you today it's a, a great platform that you have here and I typically try to watch every Saturday or or watch the replays um, so I got started in plan giving uh, in the mid 2000s. And before that, I, I cut my teeth. I started my career in financial services and I bounced around a little bit. I couldn't really find my footing right, right out of the co college. And um, I got the opportunity to join TIAA CREF in the early 2000s. And there they uh, really encouraged me to go back and get my master's in tax and uh, go take the CFP exam. And so that was a great educational foundation but uh, TIAA had a, a acquired a company called Caspic around that same time. Caspic is one of the largest uh, in, uh, money managers uh, in the charitable space, mo mostly for charitable trusts, CRT, CLTs, and uh, for CGA pools for uh, charity. So I uh, did some work with Caspic while I was at TIAA, uh, but I also started to meet with clients who were philanthropic, and they really felt like they uh, couldn't go to any one person to help them kind of think through their charitable planning. And so when I was working with a client of mine, this is when I still lived in Iowa before I moved to Florida, when I was um, in Iowa still, one of my clients was the president of the, uh, the university foundation where I lived at Iowa State University. And he said, would you ever consider being a plan giving officer? And when I looked up what it was and learned that this was an entire this was a cottage industry usually made up of people who came from tax finance or law who defected from those uh, industries um, i felt like i immediately found a new home 
And so uh, I led the uh, plan giving program at Iowa State University for about five years. And I got a call one day from a headhunter that said, would you ever consider moving to Florida? The University of Florida is, is uh, beginning to seriously consider expanding and building their plan giving program. This was circa 2012. And talked my wife into uh, taking the leap and moving to Florida. And we had we were blessed to, to have uh, 10 years at the University of Florida uh, where I led the Office of State and Gift Planning and, and learned a lot uh, over that time frame. What keeps me in it, Alan, is, uh, is the fast-paced change of tax law, not necessarily directly related to charitable planning, but indirectly related to charitable planning, that um, where I really get a, a rush out of donors being astonished to find ways to leave their legacy philanthropically, but still uh, meet all their other objectives, whatever they are. So that's really what keeps me in it. Beautiful. Okay, let's get started. Okay, great. For the time that we have today, I thought that we would uh, touch on three things. Um, one is as to talk, I, I'm using the term trends, but uh, these, are, uh, these are kind of new concepts and new opportunities that are really important because again of indirect laws that impact charitable planning so we're going to uh, touch on a couple of those uh, specifically i want to talk about donor advice funds and i want to talk a little bit about the proposed regs that came out at the end of 2023 uh, related to uh, donor advice funds particularly code section 4966 um, but then I want to pivot to talking about a little bit about the SECURE Act. Now, Alan, I know you've talked about the SECURE Act many times on, on your platform here. We're going to touch on some issues, you know, related to the SECURE Act that, uh, that probably majority of your audience is aware of. But I'd like to go deeper into one of the charitable planning tools that I think most of your audience has probably heard of. But I really want to go into the implementation of, of actually this tool, which is the Testamentary Charitable Remainder Trust. At that time, I've gotten the, the opportunity over the last few months now of using Estate View and just you know test driving it a little bit. And I've observed where I think that Estate View provides some really uh, effective uh, tools for charitable planning uh, that I think are very helpful for any type of professional advisor. And then if we have time, I'd love you know, for you to open up um, a state view and dive into a real life case study from the University of Florida. And um, it's a, a really interesting case. And um, I have actually used a state view with it a little bit, but seeing you know, what you, how you would approach using a state view with it would take it to a, a whole nother level. So does that sound good, Alan, for the agenda? Fantastic. Okay, great. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so donor advice funds. Let's talk about that one first. So we know that donor advice funds are these versatile tools and they have revolutionized philanthropic planning. And I remember back in 1999 was the first time I had ever heard the term donor advice fund. I was working for uh, Van Campen Funds. It was it's a big mutual fund complex, and I was in the elevator, and there was kind of a guy I was friends with, and he was it was his last day, and I said, well, "Greg, what are you doing?" He said, "I'm going to work for Fidelity," and I'm I'm I said, "Oh, really? What you know? What are you going to be doing?" He goes, "Well, technically, I'm going to be working for Fidelity Charitable. It's a, a separate entity." I said, "Really? What are you what are you doing there?" He said, well, "We're going to be you know trying to you know." Uh, do, do what we did here at Van Campen, which is get money in the door into our mutual funds, but these are, these are called donor advice funds. I said, wow, that's very interesting. I never heard of that term before, but that was the first time I had heard it. Um, I started hearing about it more and more between 1999 and 2006. And when I would ask, you know, um, you know, uh, attorneys or other advanced planning consultants um, questions about DAF, they would say, well, this is really unsettled law yet. We don't know a lot about donor advised funds, but that 1991 private letter ruling that Fidelity got was the beginning to this meteoric, meteoric rise of donor advised funds. You can see on the right hand side of your screen, uh, 2021 was a pretty big year uh, for charities, but 
Um, if you look at the top 20 largest charities in the United States in terms of inflows of donations in the year 2021, you can count them there, but I'm pretty sure there's 10 of the organizations that are uh, donor advised fund sponsors there. And I believe it's four out of the, out of the first five that are donor advised funds. And of course, Fidelity now is the largest charity in the United States. And um, as they say in the, the movie Tele Talladega Nights, if you're not first, you're last. And uh, Fidelity is uh, the largest charity in the United States by a country mile today. And I think that this chart on the right-hand side is probably what scares some of our legislators, like Mr. Chuck Grassley from my home state of Iowa, who since, you know, I think the beginning, uh, didn't really like donor advice funds and were very skeptical of them. But what this chart doesn't show you is all of the grants that have happened, you know, over the decades now that have been made from donor advised funds. So um, that's kind of a, a little bit of an introduction. A donor advised fund is really inside a public charity. And and that the and so when that happens, the organization is is uh, classified by the IRS as what's called a sponsoring organization. So that's a little bit different from a private foundation, right? Because that is owned separately, and uh, it's a separate legal entity with con control structures and really many separate rules. Um, there are some tax governance and compliance similarities uh, between the two, but there's also many differences between the two. Um, for for example, uh, for donor advised funds, because the, the donor is making a donation to a public charity, the income tax uh, benefits as it relates to the charitable income tax deduction are really identical for making a gift to a donor advised fund uh, to a public charity. So you know the rules, 50% of AGI for cash gifts, actually 60% through the end of 2025 and then 30% limitation of the taxpayers at AGI for gifts of capital assets. So the same tax treatment, you compare that to private foundations, it's 30% for cash and 20% for long-term gain assets. So, um, so DAFs do have preferential treatment that way. One other big one that um, I don't th know that a lot of uh, donors are even aware of, is that when you are making a donation of a capital asset to a private foundation uh, that you, unless it's publicly traded securities uh, uh, or uh, it's basically publicly traded securities, anything else the taxpayer is typically limited to, their, uh, to the lesser of their basis or the fair market value. And so that would be like for an example, like a closely held business. And so in many cases, if a taxpayer is looking for a significant charitable income tax deduction for donating, say, a closely held business, they probably would want to consider either A, a donor advised fund, or B, a type one or type two supporting organization because they, you would, the taxpayer would be able to deduct the full fair market value uh, of those assets based on a qualified appraisal. So that's just one of the, I think, some of the many reasons why donor advice funds have become so appealing over the last uh, two or three decades. National Philanthropic Trust did a study of, of DAFs in 22, I think it was, and at that time they said that there was 230 billion uh, in donor advice funds, and so that was that's already a couple years ago. So it's probably well over 250 billion today and growing. Um, I think that's all for this slide. Go ahead to the next one, Alan. Let, let me just mention, there is another variety of entity that a number of our clients have used, and that is the private operating foundation. So with a private operating foundation, it's controlled by the family. You don't need public participation and donations, and the charity has to operate but they have granted rulings where the operation of a scholarship program can qualify. The foundation employees or directors interview students, they provide criteria, they provide mentorship, they provide award ceremonies, and then they can put their appreciated, for example, a fully depreciated building in there, into that entity and get a donation 
for fair market value. Also, yes. another alternative is a school. If you set up a school, a church, mosque, or synagogue, or a medical research organization, or a clinic that, sat, that qualifies as a hospital, that can be controlled by one family and still get, pup, and get full public charity treatment. So I wanted to say something during this presentation, and that's it. It's an excellent point. And do do they and, and they and they don't have to worry about the public support test with that structure, right? Because right. That's right. With any of those structures, they don't have to worry about it. In fact, the Tampa Times is owned by the Point Pointer Institute, which is a 501c3 school with no charity, no public charity requirements, and it, it owns an operating newspaper as an example. That's right, and that that would be like a uh, probably a, a closely held C corporation, I would mm -hmm. imagine. Yeah, okay. which paid taxes on its income. That's right. That makes complete sense. And okay, then the great. dividends that it pays up to the charity are not subject to tax. No, no, you bet from dividends, right? That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Back to you. That's good. Okay, well. I wondered if did the Pension Protection Act do anything to protect pensions? And I've I've never actually ever found that out because what I've found is that the Pension Protection Act, in many ways, uh, revolutionized charitable planning today. Uh, you know, 17 years later, there are very important elements of the Pension Protection Act that um, we use on a daily basis. How about this one? qualified charitable distributions um, that came from the Pension Protection Act. Uh, there were um, many others too. Uh, uh, the Pension Protection Act first made it really appealing for donors to donate sub S corporations. It's still a very difficult uh, transaction potentially, but um, there were a number of things, but they were all, you know, these were all temporary laws. And then finally by 2015, we got the PATH Act uh, signed by President Obama, which made a lot of those um, opportunities permanent law, like the qualified charitable distribution. So this was monumental for charitable planning. What the um, Pension Protection Act also did is it finally put a definition to donor advised funds. And um, so it, it um, created this definition of what donor advised funds were and what they weren't. Also introduced the um, type one two and three supporting organizations and you know clarify the differences of those and so this was a very important um aspect of where we got to with donor advice funds since 2006 um, there have been opportunities for donors to hire their own investment managers to manage their DAFs. Um, Community foundations have figured out ways to work with the Pension Protection Act. For instance, um, the uh, the qualified charitable distribution does not um, is not allowed to go to a private foundation, a supporting organization, or uh, a donor advice fund. Okay, but community foundations have created something called field of interest funds that would qualify for a qualified uh, charitable distribution. Uh, and so I wanted to mention that because uh, there are some things in the proposed regs that could um, could challenge uh, some of those things that we've kind of grown to uh, get used to and accustomed to over the last 17 years. Anything so more for, to add to this? Yeah. So for some of the for the we have some laymen on the on the call. Um, so a qualified charitable distribution is a transfer directly from the IRA of someone who is over 70 and a half to a charity. And the, the donor who has the IRA does not pay income tax on as if it was withdrawn. There's no charitable deduction, but you still come out ahead of where it would have been if you had taken money out of your IRA, paid the tax, and made the charitable deduction. And for most taxpayers over 70 and a half, that's going to be the most efficient way to benefit charity. It does not work on a Roth IRA. It's a regular IRA. It doesn't work before you're 70 and a half. The other thing is, you know, once you're 73 or whatever age, you have the minimum distribution rules. The transfer from the IRA to charity will also 
uh, qualify as part of your minimum distribution. And this year, the most you can move from your 401, I mean, from your IRA to charity is 105,000. It was 100,000 for a long time. It just started getting inflation adjusted. Next year, it'll be 111,000 something, most likely. And if your minimum distribution is 200,000 and you put 105 to charity, 95 you take out. If your minimum distribution is 80, you can move 80 to charity and then it's up to you if you wanna do another 115 that you did not have to take out. Paul, did I miss Alan, any? No, that's an incredibly important point that you just made. Um, this is so important to the donor and it's important to charities. There is a very, very fast growing group of people over the age of 70 in the United States. Uh, the boomers uh, were born in 19, 1946. And so we now are, we're almost getting to the halfway point, probably in the next two or three years with boomers being over the age of 70, 70 and a half is where I'm going with that. And this is right now in our country under our tax regime, this is the most effective way for your average mass affluent donor client in your case to make it uh, make their charitable donations on an annual basis. Why? Because the, the um, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act doubled the uh, standard deduction. And so uh, 99 times out of 100, your uh, clients over 70, uh, average mass affluent, are, are taking the standard deduction. So this is a very powerful way to uh, for your donors to be philanthropic, and it's important for charities. Um, that 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 benefit from from these gifts so that's great um and yes now we have the inflation adjustment tied to that qcd so that's very exciting you're you're going to have clients that reach their the age of 90 that have accumulated this prodigious amount of money in their iras and their rmds are going to be four hundred thousand dollars and that's not a that's not unusual and so you're you know by giving away a hundred and ten thousand you're really just um, helping to mitigate, you know, some of those taxes for your for your aging clients with these mega retirement plans. Anything more to add here, Alan? Otherwise, we can move on. I, I, I was on the phone with a client last night, and she supports her daughter's efforts with, at a wildlife refuge, so she can get the hundred and five thousand dollars that she would have paid tax on, transfer it as a donation to the wildlife refuge. The wildlife refuge can pay her daughter a, a, a salary, and her daughter is in a lower tax bracket than she is. So that's, that's an example of what you can do with qualified distribution planning. Correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, but you can all, I believe you can also transfer the qualified charitable distribution to a private operating foundation and to a public charity that a family controls because it's a school, medical research organization, church, et cetera. You are correct. A private operating foundation would have that same treatment. So I, we have to, I have to start using that word private operating foundation when I say the word private foundation, you know, because a lot of times you forget about that tool um, that, that's available. Right. Okay. Next slide. Okay, great. And obviously, you know, one of the reasons why do people still use the, the non-operating foundations? Why? because there's a lot of control that you have, right? I mean, you can actually make grants that benefit certain individuals um, in, in, uh, in private, you know, non-operating foundations. So they're still, they're still appealing, otherwise people wouldn't have those. Um, but a lot of times people compare DAFs to private non-operating foundations and they forget about everything in the middle. Alan mentioned one of them, private, you know, operating foundation. Type one, two, and three supporting orgs. In my line of work, um, we I, I work for an organization called Charitable Solutions, we, uh, and we do consulting for a very large charity called the Decami Foundation. And we have a number of supporting orgs there. And donors uh, really, uh, the right donor loves it because you get the tax treatment of a, a public charity, similar to your uh, private operating foundation, but you still have a, a good degree of control. Whereas with donor advised funds, you don't really have any control other than these advisory privileges, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. So um, 
A little bit of legislation since 2006 before we get to the uh, proposed regs. So following the 2006 PPA, the IRS issued notice 2006-109, which provided this interim guidance on DAFs focusing on the application of excise taxes and outlining what would constitute acceptable distributions. So the IRS really was trying to, um, I, I wouldn't say level the playing field at all with, uh, with private foundations, but they, they did need to crack down a little bit on um, some abuses that were happening with donor advised funds at the time. Um, and, and the IRS needed to answer questions about grants to supporting orgs uh, as well, uh, type one, two, and three. Um, and they also took this opportunity to um, define what doesn't qualify as a DAF. So that was an important notice. Uh, actually, it still really is in force right now until the current proposed regs are finalized. We also got guidance in 2017, and this is actually really important for charities. Um, so important that I don't even know if a lot of advisors even appreciate it. But in 2007, this notice that was issued um, did two things. It talked about what would be more than an incidental benefit. Well, it, it described what would be more than an inc incidental benefit to the uh, the donor advisor, I guess, in that instance. And it addressed two things. One is uh, just a simple quid pro quo, you know, that I'm going to uh, a, a dinner that's, you know, a thousand, you know, a hundred dollars a plate, and the plate itself is thirty dollars. The IRS said no. There, you you cannot make a grant in any situation where there's even a, a tiny bit of quid pro quo. Okay, and I dealt with this, you know, in my ten plus years at University of Florida, particularly with our athletics area where people wanted to make grants and they were clearly going to receive some type of points that gave them preferential treatment on, on seats and things like that. And it's just not, not allowed. And the IRS was very clear about this. Um, the second one though was really helpful for charities actually, which was pledges. So the question, I can't remember if it was Fidelity that, that posed these questions or not, but somebody did. And they wanted to know if a pledge would be, you know, if you could satisfy a pledge, um, a personal pledge using a DAF. Now with, with uh, private foundations, and again, I'll have to keep saying private non-operating foundations now, Alan, but um, you, you, you can't do that. That would be self-dealing, right? Um, but the IRS kind of surprised us here. They said, um, you could, you could satisfy a pledge. And, uh, and they even addressed whether the pledge was binding or non-binding. And the IRS said, you know, the supporting org, it's going to be too much on the supporting org to worry about whether that pledge was binding or non-binding. So just don't, don't tell us. Don't tell, don't tell anybody. Don't tell the sponsoring org. So it became kind of our, our funny don't ask, don't tell rule um, in the charitable planning world. And so, uh, but typically most donor advice fund sponsors are very um, open to uh, a statement of intent. So you could sign a statement of intent with a charity uh, if you were a donor to say, I'm gonna give you 100,000 a year for five years and those gifts are gonna come from my DAF. The sponsoring organizations, even the largest ones seem to be open to that as long as it's not a gift agreement, but it's a statement of intent. Um, and so that's been really helpful for charities to kind of get long-term uh, pledges and gifts from donors who have the majority of their, their wealth that they're using for charity in these DAFs. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, and then we can talk a little bit about the proposed regs, is that um, there were proposed regs issued at the end of 2023, and then the Treasury um, you know, opened up the floor to suggest uh, to um, input, and so that that opportunity that window closed I think February 15th, and there's going to be a public hearing here just in a few weeks I think on May 6th uh, as it relates to the proposed regs. So anything on this screen, Alan, that you would add to? Let, let me give you some examples so you can tell me. So Marsh and I make a non-binding pledge of intent to leave $100,000 to the University of Florida on our death to fund a scholarship. We die 
and my will says I request that my children, now that they've taken over my donor advised fund, should uh, go ahead and fulfill that pledge. No problem there, right? Okay. No, not that I can think of. Okay. Now, alternative two, Marsha and I signed a binding pledge, which says we agree to give the University of Florida $2,000 a year for the rest of our lives to pay for scholarships, and on the death of the survivor of us, another 100,000. Then we both die. Can our children satisfy that from the donor advised fund, or is that gray? I don't, based on this notice of 2017, I don't know that they used a lot of testamentary examples in that notice, but I, based on what my interpretation of is of that notice, I would think that would be acceptable. Um, I, I don't think, like, I, I don't know that your, you know, is your your uh, children in that example, you know, wouldn't have to necessarily legally make that grant. All they're doing is legally making a recommendation. That's what your will says, right? It's, you know, we we ask, you know, you, my daughter, please make this recommendation of a grant to the sponsor. Just remember but the sponsor. It, right, but I'm saying to my, but if you don't, then they're gonna come sue my estate. And you'll- There is that. will get smaller, but that's still okay. Yes, it, okay. exactly. You know, people who get into, you know, go into an irrevocable commitment, hopefully they've kind of thought those things through, you know, worth the worst case scenarios, so. Okay. My third example is Marsh and I want to go to the annual gala dinner to award scholarship donors. The cost of the ticket is $300. It says fair market value of the dinner, $80. So I know I can't pay the 300 from the, from the donor advised fund. Can I pay 240 from the donor advised fund and 60 from my own money? If 60 is the fair market value of the of the event, I don't think they allow you to bifurcate that. Um, and that's also you could have said the same thing about a QCD actually, um, if you were over 70 and a half, which I know you're nowhere near that, Alan. But um, you know that that's you're not allowed to bifurcate. I don't think either for QCDs or for DAFs in that in those instances. Okay, great. And, and it's probably because I mean you could write a check, and you know, and you could write a check, and of course you're going to get a deduction for the, you know, the the fair market value minus the value of the meal, but um, that's the easiest way to keep a record of that. So I would imagine that the reason why you can't do that with a DAF or QCD is the record keeping would just be, you know, a nightmare probably. Got it. Okay. Thank you. What's next? Okay, so the proposed regs. Now, if you really want to get a full understanding of the proposed regs, um, I'm not your person. I'm going to just mention a few things that I've observed, um, but there are a couple of ways, if you wanted to get educated on this real fast, I would recommend. If you went to the uh, IRS's website and you read uh, the, the, the organizations or individuals who have made comments about the proposed regs, it's really illuminating. And I think that probably the the best one that I've seen so far is from ACTEC. And so they they have a you know they they have a statement um, about the proposed regs and um, it's a very rational statement. Um, American Endowment Foundation. A lot of individuals, a lot of individual tax attorneys, uh, financial advisors have uh, posted comments that I think you'd find very interesting and illuminating. But the proposed regs, I think, as I understand it, are going to be part of a bigger legal framework that may be, um, you may see this over several years. But the first thing that they're um, addressing is Internal Revenue Code 4966. And they're they're looking at the um, the definition, kind of broadening the definition of a donor advice fund, broadening the definition of a donor and the definition of a donor advisor. And 
what you're going to find is that there's really nothing in the proposed regs that addresses any type of required minimum distribution, which, as many of you know, a, a, a private non-operating foundation has a 5% required minimum distribution each year, as does a type 3 supporting organization. Um, and so a lot of people thought that, you know, Chuck Grassley and, you know, all these folks that are, have had such issues with donor advice funds, that they were going to, you know, push through some type of minimum distribution. And we don't see that at all. So, um, so I just want to touch on um, some of the points here. Um, and again, this was, we haven't really heard other than that one notice from 2017 that I mentioned, we haven't really heard much from the IRS about donor advised funds since 2006, um, 17 years. And so um, the regulations define a donor to include a person that makes a contribution to the fund unless such contributors are only public charities or governmental units. Uh, sponsoring organizations should review their list of donors to uh, existing DAF to determine if any fund would no longer be considered a DAF under these proposed regs. Um, and so some people are concerned that the broadening definition of a DAF would actually include field of interest funds at community foundations. And so that's probably one of the bigger concerns. Um, I'm not exactly sure that the, uh, you know, the, why the proposed reg actually brings that into the, the discussion, but it's definitely um, something that the community foundation world is, is concerned about because as I mentioned previously, you know, community foundations, a lot of them are built on field of interest funds because uh, I'll give you an example during COVID, you know, a community foundation could set up a field of interest fund that would support like a, a musician who couldn't perform during that period of time. And the field of interest fund could actually support that individual, right? And so if the definition of a, of a, of a um, field of interest fund is now all of a sudden a donor advised fund, they can't make grants to support specific individuals because that's part of the rules uh, with DAFs. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is kind of the definition of a donor. The regs define a donor to include a person that makes a contribution to the fund. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, the donor advisor. Let's get to donor advisor for a second. Um, so this is um, anyone who is, uh, define a donor advisor to include any person appointed or designated by the donor to have advisory privileges regarding the, the uh, distribution or uh, investment of assets in the DAF. So um, where we're going here is that the regs are saying that uh, it would be an excess benefit. I believe that's the, 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 the uh, argument here, an excess benefit to hire your own advisor to manage your DAF. And so the, uh, it, what this is doing is it's broadening the definition of a donor advisor to actually include a donor's financial advisor. And so what they're saying is the, the inclusion of a personal investment advisor for a DAF um, surprised a lot of people for one thing, but the consequences of this inclusion is that the payment of compensation to that personal investment advisor from a DAF is an automatic excess benefit transaction, and that's subject to excise taxes under 49.58. Um, a lot of people, a lot of comments about this one, particularly. Um, the uh, amount subject to tax is the amount of compensation paid for the investment management services uh, from the DAF. So, for an example, if the compensation is 50 grand, the excise tax due would be 25% of the 50 grand, 12,500. Uh, in addition to the uh, to the personal investment advisor would be required to correct that excess benefit by returning the compensation with interest to the sponsoring organization, but not to the DAF. Um, so, this is one of the big things that. I think everybody's talking about, uh, this was just touched on a little bit at the Heckerling, um, 
in kind of recent updates, and that's really um, you know all that they they said. Now, um, one of the commenter, one of the people at the Hecker Lane commented to say that they felt like this this shot across the bow from the IRS was uh, because they felt like the personal investment advisors were the ones that were convincing their donors not to make grants and you know that they were selfishly trying to keep the money in the DAF and I and and that attorney that was speaking on this didn't say that that was her own belief but um but that 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 is you know that's crazy to me because I would think why not just impose then a five percent minimum or do something like that right um the last thing I wanted to say about this before we start talking about the SECURE Act and testamentary CRTs is that, you know, one of the things about donor advice funds is there's a lot of people that um, throw shade on donor advice funds. They think it's bad for public policy, that there's no required distribution. A lot of people in the field have argued that grant that uh, people have made grants from their DAFs without having a minimum distribution rule. Um, I started watching a show last night on Apple TV called ben Benjamin Franklin. Michael Douglas is playing Benjamin Franklin, and it made me think about a story that I read about Benjamin Franklin that um, his will in 1790 uh, um, left a donation to, I think, both the city of Philadelphia and the city of Boston, I think. And they he wanted them to spend some of the money right away, but then invest the money for 200 years and then make a grant at that time for artistmen um, or, or craftsmen, I guess you, you might say. And so the Philadelphia Community Foundation in 1993, we're going back 1790 to 1993, they get a grant or they get the money to set up a field of interest fund to support people to go into all kinds of things, to be a, a mechanic, a HVAC, a HVAC, and all these uh, electricians and all of these types of things. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, the charity is going to get the money and the, the, the money is growing in the DAF. So I just wanted to throw that counter argument out there that you know so many people have against donor advice funds money's eventually going to come out one last thing to add to daft before we move on alan um, i can't remember the attorney from south florida but he produced a um, a webinar for lissy on succession planning for dafts now it sounds to me like you and marcia already are thinking about your succession plan for your DAF, but, but your average client is not and there's actually a kind of a secret in our industry that a lot of people, when they when they set up their donor advised funds, they don't have a succession plan. And then when they die, guess who gets to use that money to to uh, make the grants? It's the donor advised fund sponsor. Wow. And yeah, and I never thought so of that. Imagine, oh my gosh. Yeah, it kind of is a nice PR tool if you're a big financial, I'm not gonna mention any names because I, I work with them and they're great organizations, but imagine you know, you getting to play God with that money and you know, make grants in your local community uh, with uh, you know, deceased uh, don donor advice fund you know, um, donors or advisors, because they're called advisors. Um, so succession planning is really important. And, um, and they wrote a great paper, this attorney in South Florida and his daughter, who's an attorney, wrote a great paper on it. And um, I just wanted to mention that because succession planning for your um, client's donor advised funds is an important element of the estate planning process to uh, add to your checklist. Alan, any, any additional thoughts on DAFs? No, I just wanted to say that one of the best books I ever read was the biography of Benjamin Franklin by Eisenstein. Yeah. Eisenstadt wrote an amazing biography, and Franklin made a daily list of things to do. He made a monthly list of things to do. He wrote down his goals. I think at age 41 or age 46, he had set up these printing companies, and he basically franchised them, and then yes. he lived on his franchise royalties. He traveled the world, and then he uh, invented the, uh, what do you call it, the, the lightning deflector, which saved, yes. which saved 
has saved millions of lives and he gave that patent away. He never, he just gave it to the US. He just said, anyone can do this for free. Put a lightning rod on your roof. So what, what a smart, neat guy. He joined yes, every right. synagogue and church in his community. He was just very, very well, well liked. And he had a lot of yes. fun. He loved beer. All right. So, all right. A renaissance man, if you will. Not for that. All right. So tell us, tell us some very cool planning techniques here. Oh, okay. In our time we left. Have 14 minutes. So mention 14 okay. planning techniques. We'll, we will rapidly move through these quicker. And you know what? That's probably a good thing because you've hit on Secure Act. You know, you could go back and look at some of Alan's um, previous webinars on Secure Act with some of his colleagues at his firm, and they're superb. Uh, so, and, and in fact, I'm not even really going to talk much about the Secure Act other than, um, you know, that we now have kind of three definitions of what a beneficiary potentially can even be from a retirement plan. You have a, um, you have a, as Natalie Choke says, a plain old beneficiary, which is really uh, any person who is not an eligible designated beneficiary. So that's the new one that's introduced. Um, we're gonna, I have a slide on it, but we probably don't even need to hit on these five, you know, eligible designated beneficiaries. Those are the only ones, as probably everyone on the call knows, that still uh, can take a life expectancy payout, right? So um, at any rate, I wanna talk about where charities come into play as one of those beneficiaries. Um, let's see here. Um, so we are, where are, okay, so we're on, uh, this is a, a fact sheet that you're on here, Alan, that is, um, that I'm happy to send to anybody. You could put your own organization's logo in the top left-hand corner. And uh, I, I find that this um, flowchart is important for your clients because it used to be, you know, before the, um, before the SECURE Act, that the QCD and the minimum distribution age was what? They were the same. Age 70 and a half, it was easy. It was easy. And now, of course, it, it, it jumped after secure to age 72 and then secure 2.0 to age 73. And then it'll be, you know, um, 75, uh, you know, in 2033, I believe. So it's just really confusing for donors to kind of now link the QCD and the RMD together. So that's really all this flow chart does. And what it also does in the bottom right hand corner is that if you do qualify for a QCD, which type of QCD is best for you? Of course, you can make an outright um, QCD on an annual basis, as Alan mentioned, um, and that's uh, currently 105,000 a year adjusted for inflation. Some of you on the call also may know that because of Secure 2.0, which was signed at, um, in the end of 22, uh, put into law at the beginning of 23, that your clients can now make a one-time qualified charitable distribution to a charity to establish a charitable gift annuity. And that's a, a, a nice uh, uh, deal. It's unfortunately just a one-time deal, but it is also inflation adjusted. So that's now 53,000 in 2024. I have yet to find one donor who has set up a charitable remainder trust for 50,000. Now the University of Florida, by the way, Alan, has kept their minimum uh, for a CRTs to 50,000 uh, for, and they're willing to serve as trustee, but I can't think of too many other corporate trustees. They would laugh if you said, you know, we, we need to set, you know, we would set one up for 50,000, but this uh, works great for g charitable gift annuities for your donors that would just like a little bit of extra income. Um, so that is a new uh, rule that was introduced. Um, Alan, anything more to add to that? Well, it, Hopefully they'll move that 50 up because it is a great opportunity to, instead of taking that money and being taxed on it, you take it into the charitable remainder trust and then you get taxed on it over a period of time. And for most people who do this, it'll be 100,000 because the both members of a married couple will do it together. For 100,000, yes. if the charity is willing to set up the charitable remainder trust and to be the trustee, it's worth it. It's worthwhile to do for 100. Thousand. It'll save you thirty-seven thousand dollars worth of income taxes to defer. So, but I haven't seen any done. <laughs> that being Not said. yet, but I can see where that that could work. You know, with uh, both uh, the married couple. Okay, so 
if you want to learn everything you need to learn about where we're at with the SECURE Act and the impact that it has on, uh, on, on estate planning for your clients as it relates to their retirement plan assets, go back and watch some of the webinars that Alan and his colleagues have done. Um, because we right now we still have proposed regs from the what the spring of 22 anyway that have not yet been made uh, permanent. So I, I think that's kind of where we stand. Um, so I'm not going to get into the Secure Act at all, but uh, other than to say that you know some of the things that Alan and his colleagues have talked about with the impact that this has on trusts, on see-through trusts. Uh, whether you're looking at a conduit trust or an accumulation trust, there's there's pros and cons to using both of them, especially now um, as it relates to uh, the new rules imposed by the Secure Act, specifically the 10-year cap. But anyway, that's as far as I'm going to go with it. Let, let me what, let, yeah, let me because again, we have a lot of laymen on the on the on the program. So when you die, your IRA can roll into an IRA for your spouse. Your spouse then takes it out when she, re when she reaches age 70 or whatever it is over that period of time. But if you die and you don't leave a surviving spouse, if you leave it the right way, then, or the right to the right person, or to a trust properly structured for the right person, they basically don't have to take it out until year 11. And it's unclear in some circumstances whether they have to take a little bit out a year in years one through 10. But Wednesday, we were blessed with an IRS announcement which says the law is still unclear. You don't have to take anything out until that 11th year unless you want to. So a lot of clients are going to die. And with, let's say, a million dollar IRA, and the kids go, okay, well, this is great. I don't have to touch any of this until year 11. In year 11, this thing's gonna be worth $2 million, and I'm gonna have to pay a 37% income tax in year 11, and that's not such a good thing. I wish mom and dad had considered making the beneficiary of this IRA a charitable remainder trust, which would have allowed me to take the money out over 20 years, or maybe even not to take anything out until year 15 through 20. So that's the layman's version. And now Paul is going to much better explain that. Yes. And the quote on the bottom right from attorney Bruce Steiner kind of captures it really for me because he says that the benefit of the stretch through the CRT, and we're all so familiar with that nickname stretch, which was basically a, that the beneficiary had a lifetime payout, a life expectancy payout, is because that's gone. He says that the benefit of the stretch through the CRT, because you, you can, Alan mentioned that you can set up a CRT for a term of years. You can also, as long as uh, there, the, the, the CRT passes uh, this test, that actuarially the 10% uh, of the remainder goes to charity at the time it's funded, um, it can be for the life of the uh, beneficiary. So unless the beneficiary is probably under age 30, you're probably going to be able to, at least today, um, today's IRS 7520 rates, you probably could set up a lifetime charitable remainder trust, which would resurrect the stretch for uh, most beneficiaries. Now, the only thing I disagree with Bruce in his comment is he, is he says that it may offset or outweigh the loss of the remainder interest. Remember, the donor still gets to pick the charity. So that is not a loss. A loss is it going to, to, the, to the IRS, so uh, to Treasury. So I think that I think it's a great deal for the right donors. Um, and if we want to, so you can see here on the on the right hand side, just this is just a visual. Again, um, for the layperson uh, on the call, a charitable remainder trust is a tax-exempt trust if it uh, path if it if it follows the rules of 664 of the Internal Revenue Code. So I'll just keep it to that. But for that reason, because it's tax-exempt, at the death of the surviving spouse, let's say that each of them has IRAs, 
and they've named husband is named wife as the primary, wife is named husband as the primary, but the secondary beneficiary is their charitable remainder trust for the benefit of their adult daughter. And that is all that, that whatever's left in the IRA or IRAs at that time will all go, you know, tax free roll. You could use the term roll tax free into the CRT. The trust has to pay at least a minimum of 5% to the daughter for the rest of her life. This is a normal, a, a regular, just standard charitable remainder unit trust, okay? And then everything that's left at her demise, the daughters, goes to the charities that the donors originally wanted to support. So that's just kind of the, the, the theoretical concept. Let's hit on just a couple more things, Alan, and then we'll bring it in for a landing. Um, okay. If you want to go to the next slide, go ahead. I just I just want to mention you can give the beneficiary the power to select the charity and you can make the IRA payable to a trust for your child and then the trustee for that trust can decide whether to accept the IRA in year 11 or to push it by disclaimer to the charitable remainder trust. So the way you draft this is on my death, my IRA will go to the to Uncle Fred as trustee for my daughter, Sandra. Within 180 days of my death, Uncle Fred could disclaim that to the Sandra Charitable Remainder Trust. Then Uncle Fred and Sandra sit down and talk about it. Okay, next slide. Perfect. This was when the SECURE Act first came out. Um, one of my colleagues at University of Florida put together a really nice Excel calculator on this. And, um, and it's basically just three scenarios. Scenario one, all things again being equal in terms of how much money uh, a 50 year old, let's say if you, you have a 50 year old who's the beneficiary of mom's IRA, okay? And all things being equal in every scenario, it's a half a million dollar IRA. Uh, scenario one is I'm, I cash it in right away, but I'm smart enough to take it to my investment manager and have her manage it. Probably an unlikely scenario, but let's just say that's number one. Okay, number two is I wait for 10 years. And now, as Alan mentioned, it's a little unclear if I could even wait for 10 years if my mom had already been taking her RMD. So we don't even know yet if we have the full 10 years, but you could see scenario two is better. Scenario three, Charitable remainder, unit trust, 5%. Again, we're assuming that that 50-year-old has 35 years uh, to live. And so the dotted line represents all of the income that was provided to, uh, to that 50-year-old uh, during their life. And then you get to see the dotted line above that, the remainder to charity. So it's if, if, you, if you were required to take distributions in years one through nine, Scenario two and three might almost be, in some cases, neck and neck. Of course, this is just an assumption. Every situation is different. But for your donors who I think even have just an ounce of philanthropic intent and they're, un, you know, they're uncertain of how they want to leave their retirement plans for the benefit of their adult children, this is definitely one to uh, explore a little further. Uh, I'll just touch on what uh, Jonathan Blockmacher had to say about this, Alan, um, in the next slide. And it, you're, again, chime in as I go here, but I want to be respectful of your time. So Jonathan Blockmacher and a couple of other folks, Randy Fox and I think uh, Jonathan's nephew, published a paper right after Secure, and you can find it online. I'm happy to send it to anybody. It's a great paper because it kind of provides this foundation of of what the repercussions are as they understood it of the SECURE Act, what the benefit, what a CRT is. So it really goes into that. And then Jonathan takes it hyper into a very specific, unique concept um, called a uh, net income charitable remainder unit trust, which has been around in the, in the tax code probably since 1969. That's what um, charitable remainder trusts were first kind of defined. Mm -hmm. um, and, and th that's you know kind of a lot of the rules that we still use today, but you know a, a net income charter remainder trust is uh, basically this concept that you're funding. It, it usually comes into play when you're funding a, tr a charter remainder trust with maybe an illiquid asset, and it may take a while for the uh, the trust to actually sell that asset, and there may not be much income produced by that investment at all. 
And so this gives the income beneficiary an opportunity, or the trustee, I should say, an opportunity to make up for those years where the income was less than the amount that's typically required for CTs, which is 5%. So that's really what a NIMCRA is. But here's what Lotmacher says about it. If you go to the next slide, Ellen. So um, he says that you know, he's got a very interesting take on, on um, the, the, the Alaska laws, because I believe that um, uh, their trust company is based up there in Alaska. And he says that um, the number one, a trustee may be able to change the investments so that the receipts do not constitute fiduciary accounting income and are well in excess of the unit trust amount for a year. Okay, that's that's fine. But he says some states have statutes which seem to permit the um, significant flexibility on controlling the amount and timing of the fiduciary accounting income. And he particularly uh, is using the Alaska uh, laws as an example there. So he throws out this idea of what if you, what if the uh, the, the NIMCRA actually uh, is a partner and it basically owns a single member LLC uh, structure. I, I guess it doesn't have to be single member necessarily, but I would imagine it, it typically would in this example. And why he's posing this idea is that you could theoretically set up a 10% a a, a CRUT, uh, NIMCRUT for 20 years, and it would pass the uh, that 10% requirement I mentioned earlier, the actuarial 10% of the remainder has to go to charity. But you could literally, the uh, the trustee and the, uh, I guess the, the the GP or the managing you know uh, partner of the of the LLC could it would have to probably be different people, but they could actually work together on controlling those distributions so that you could literally defer, like literally defer for 19 years out of that 20 years, um, uh, using the interpretations of current law, uh, all the assets. So if you had like a, a son that was a wealthy surgeon who's um, 50 years old, okay, and he's making a million dollars a year right now, the last thing that he wants is to inherit an IRA where in he has to take a minimum distribution each year. Again, that's unclear, but then in that year 10 is going to have to empty out a large IRA and he's already in the you know highest tax bracket. So in that case, this strategy could be very powerful in terms of tax deferral. Tax deferral for, for uh, 19 years would be incredible, but I do think that for your average donor, they're going to be more interested in, all right, I have a daughter, she needs income on an annual basis, I'd rather give that to her than this big IRA that the minimum distribution rules are confusing. So I think that's where you're going to see it mostly. There's three ways to structure these. Um, you could structure a testamentary CRT in your uh, in your client's last will or rev trust. Um, now you'd have to look at the rules on on whether or not the estate or the trust would actually be taxed on the distribution from the IRA. Um, so the uh, the maybe the cleaner way to do it is to simply name get a ch change of beneficiary form from the IRA custodian name a dry trust uh, a, a, that wasn't funded during your client's lifetime, you could make it actually revocable and then it would become irrevocable on the death of the grantor. And why would you even need to do that? I was told by a, a, a tax attorney that I respect um, a great deal in this space. He said there are some states that, uh, that, that uh, I guess, prohibit dry trusts. So uh, irrevocable trusts that are unfunded, basically. That's my understanding of what a dry trust is. So he says, just make it revocable and then you know, irrevocable on the death. And, and so then that way it just flows right from the IRA because the trust is the beneficiary um, you know, of that IRA. It goes right, goes right there. So that's basically the cleanest way to do it. You could also set up a CRT now for your daughter and then name your um, IRA as the beneficiary, and then the, uh, the 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 trust would already be in place. You know, it'd have its own living, breathing EIN, and it's already going. So you could do that as a third option as well. 
So Alan, I think those two trends are really important as it relates to recent regulations. Um, and I, again, I see in you at the Heckerling, I was really um, excited to see how far you've gotten with the state view. And just in uh, the 15 minutes that I ran into you at the Heckerling to see some of this amazing um, you know, analysis that a state view can do with charitable planning, I think is really powerful. So I'm excited to see, you know, uh, you know, some of your examples here. Um, I'll let you drive, but do you want me to just throw out some examples of how charitable planning can be uh, can be utilized through a state view? Yeah, let, give me three or four minutes just to okay. orientate. Um, bathroom break is fine now. We're going to talk about some miscellaneous stuff, and you can watch the tape back at 66 minutes in it. You've gotten your continuing education credit if that's what you want from Florida for lawyers or CPAs. Now we're having fun and doing some really cool stuff. So yes. if you're not already a subscriber, it's free until May 1st, and then you still have to consent before you could ever be charged. Uh, you, go, you put in your browser, top left-hand side, the state view is one word dot link. Click on it, it comes up, just invent your own email address, invent your own password, click on it, and you're in. It's free. Or pay a dollar later, or just send me an email if you want to be a, a founder. And if you're a founder, then may, if you decide to buy in in May, you get two months free, uh, plus your pricing the first couple of years after that is, is um, fixed. It can't go up. It's $1.99 a year for the basic, which does almost everything that all the other calculators do plus more it's three it's 4.99 a year for the best so when you pull it up you see a screen with comprehensive calculators and technique calculators and you will just click on what you select for example if i select married couple then i'm going to get a uh, married couple of course and then I can show this couple that based upon their net worth and all the information I can enter into it, if they do no planning and they live 15 years, then they're going to have an estate tax of 19 million. But if they leave it all to charity, instead of 19 going to Uncle Sam and 49 going to the children, click on charity. Charity gets 49 million. Kids get 19 million. Uncle Sam gets nothing. Kids are not so happy. It cost them 29 million. So then we could show, well, if you did a charitable remainder trust, which would delay the tax and still end up with the kids getting, say, 80% of the assets, which is feasible, or 30% of the assets, which is feasible. Now the estate tax is zero. The kids get 19 million on death, 34 million over time for a total of 54 million. Now, this is now saying a charitable lead annuity trust, but a charitable remain a, a, a charitable remainder testamentary trust would pretty much work this way. So that'll be a new module sometime in May or June. We'll have a, a click here for charity outright, charity clat or Charity Charitable Remainder Trust. And does that sound right, Paul? Yes, I think that would be powerful because you have a module now for CRTs, obviously, um, and they are uh, you know, probably in, in mind for intra vivos CRTs, but um, you could use it to model a testamentary CRT, but I think if you put it there and you could see how it could help us uh, mitigate the state taxes. Um, that that would be helpful. Also, remember too, you would be in in some cases mitigating income tax for the beneficiaries. If you could, if that if, if that that could be modeled, that would be really powerful. But um, but yeah, I think that would be great to have that extra feature there, Alan. And then I think you were saying that the the, the charitable calculators that people have really don't give the client the whole picture of their estate tax. Whereas here, no. I can say no planning, 19 million tax. If you do a credit shelter trust on the first death, 16 million tax. 
If you do a qualified personal residence trust, 13 million tax. If you do annual gifting, 12 million tax, and et cetera, et cetera, down to charity. You're exactly right, Alan. I mean, what are most of our wealthy clients going to do first? They're going to probably come to you and other attorneys and set up slats. That's the first thing that they need, they, they should be doing if they're, you know, in that kind of, you know, 20 million, whatever uh, you think is the right um, wealth number to be at, then they're going to do their charitable planning. And so, you know, none of the, the software in the charitable planning world really thinks about the non-charitable planning structure that has to go into it. Right. So uh, then let's go to the uh, charitable remainder unit trust. And is this where you want to give me some inputs and we'll see where we go? Sure, I can. Um, do you want to uh, try the, that case study I sent you or just, just play around for now? Well, let me, I'll, I guess I'll play around first and then we'll do the case study. So okay. this is the standard mode. And when you set up a charitable remainder unit trust, which which receives a charitable donation or a donation. There's a deduction for the actuarial value going to charity at the end. You get the tax deduction the year you make the contribution, and then you get an annual payment for a term of years. And that annual payment is to the donor or to the family of the donor. So in standard mode, which is the $199 model, so to speak, this tells me that my assumption rate for the calculations is 5.2% because you're allowed to use the best rate for this month and the prior two months and the best rate is the highest rate. So That's this right. tells you that, so you don't get yourself in trouble. Then it also tells you, you don't use the client's last birthday, you, need, you use their nearest birthday. So if I turned 64 nine months ago, I got to use age 65 here. That's right. If you're within six months, I believe. Right. Now, these charitable remainder unit trusts can pay for life. So I'm a 65-year-old and it pays for life. Or it can pay for dual life. So if I'm 65 and Marsha's... 59, which she's been 59 for a long time now, <laughs> then I can enter both ages and it's going to give me a payout rate. And I see right which here. Very, I was just going to say that's really incredible that you've got it modeled that you 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 can model your maximum there, which is really cool because if I'm interpreting if I'm interpreting that right, the 9.5 would basically be the the as far as you could push it to pass right the 10 percent test right so this tells me that we could get 9.51 percent a year of the value of the trust every year until the death of the survivor of us and that's the highest percentage we can set it at and if we set it at that percentage we're going to get a tax deduction of 10 percent of the value of what we put in on the other hand we could we could put the payment as low as 5%. And soon I'll, I'll show you what happens uh, if we do that, but I can click down. Well, I'll show, you, I'll show you in a minute what happens there. All right, then the payments, we can get them annually, monthly, quarterly, or semi-annually. And when I click on, on monthly, you see that the, the rate goes down a little bit. It does. And then I can click on the initial trust value. So, and I'll delete the, uh, the one below that here. All right, so what I can now do is I can click to see results. And along the left, I have my inputs. I know I'm using 5.2%. I've got two lives, ages 65 and 59. I want the maximum uh, payout rate. Now, I don't have to use it. I can click that on or off, but I can use the maximum on this example. And I'm going to get monthly payments. Let's go back to annual. And across the top, it gives me in blue what my inputs were. 
and in green what my outputs are. And my outputs are that the, my payout rate, there's an adjusted payout rate. You take things into consideration, 8.631%. My charitable remainder, 110,000. And the value of the unit trust interest as of today, 889. Now, if I, and I'll, I'll go back to the maximum. So now my charitable deduction is 100,000, 10% of the million. Now I'm gonna click on duplicate here, and I'm gonna say, what happens if I just do this on Marsha's life only? So I go one life, age 59, maximize payout. So this shows me I've made two different things here. It gives me a side-by-side -side comparison, and it tells me now my payout rate, if it's Marsha alone, we can pull out 12.8% until I die, which is a better deal for her, probably, <laughs> and a better deal for me, a much better deal for me, yes. So, uh, or a worse deal for me, actually, because if she dies first. Yeah. But then there's another alternative. So I'm going to click duplicate again. And my other alternative is we can go a term up to 20 years. So if we go a 20 year term, that's not a bad middle ground because as you can see, we would get an 11% rate of return and we would get the payments at least 20 years. So if we both die within 20 years, our children could continue to receive payments. So those are three examples. And, and keep in mind that when these will usually happen are going to be, oh my gosh, a million dollar IRA coming in from my mother. How would I like to own it? My mother's 94. Hey, mom, would you make your IRA payable to a charitable remainder trust? And this would allow me to defer the payment. Or I'm about to sell my business for a million dollars and let, let's make it 10 million. I come to Paul, what do I do? I don't wanna pay tax yet. Well, would you mind benefiting the University of Florida or your church? No, wouldn't mind at all. Okay, let's do this. Let's pay the tax rateably over your lifetime or over a term of years. Absolutely. Paul, anything you wanna add before I go to a next step here? I think that's one of the beauties of the state view is just the duplicate button. So, I mean, you can um, you can have multiple scenarios in the speed of light, um, which is, is really cool. Yeah, what if I want to do a 15-year charitable remainder mm -hmm. trust? Now the payment can be 14.97. And you know what? In 15 yeah. years, Marsha and I probably won't need any more payments. Once I'm 80, I probably am not going to be uh, traveling as much. I'll just be yes. working. So... Uh, now, one question is, if we do the 20-year payments, what if I do 20 years on Mar uh, and I get a million-dollar life insurance policy on Marsha's life to replace the trust on her death because the, the remainder is going to charity? Yes. So I click on life insurance estimator, and then I click to age 59, female, and I want to get a million-dollar death benefit. I can get a 10 a 20 year term life insurance policy. Marsh is in preferred uh, status, so that would cost 3384 a year. More than paid for by the tax savings. So yes. so that's a lot of times people team a charitable remainder trust up with life insurance. In fact, a permanent policy, let me go back there. I forgot to point out she could get a permanent policy for 37,000 a year. Now, I wouldn't recommend that, but she she could. Um, and at least you can tell your client that's what it is. So- Can I say something there real quick? Sure. You know, having most, most people that work in charitable planning world, and I would assume most advisors um, don't um, sell life insurance. So they have no idea 
what the, the cost of the insurance is. Yet, it's a very important planning tool in the charitable planning world because of the mostly, uh, it, it's a generational thing. People say, well, my mom and dad left everything to me. So I would be, I would have this guilt, even if I'm very wealthy, I have this guilt about leaving a lot to charity and, and I should leave it all, you know, charity begins at home, as they say. And that's the power of, of using the life insurance. This That idea has been around for years, Alan, you know, the wealth replacement trust that you match that with a CRT because the reluctant donor says, yeah, but it's all going to charity at the end, not my kids. I'm, I feel horrible about that. Okay, use some of the income from your CRT to purchase the life insurance. That's a very, um, that, that's been around for decades. What hasn't been around for decades is that people have amassed this prodigious amount of wealth in their IRAs, which are the best asset to leave as a charitable bequest. And people have guilt about not leaving those to their kids, even though they're not that, you know, uh, be beneficial to the, to the uh, kids anyway, after secure that you could simply use your RMDs now to take out a life insurance policy to, you know, and use your RMDs to pay those premiums each year. So if, if I was in the charitable planning space, I would want to show that to my donors to say, this is a way that you can still leave the same amount to your kids and leave the, the unfriendly uh, assets like IRAs to charity. So anyway, I'll shut up, but I just wanted to throw that in there. No, that's a, that's a great point. Okay, so now I'm gonna click on the pro version. So everything I've done is on the $199 uh, standard version. So when I click on pro, we're now showing you a lot more information. Now, clients may not wanna see all this information, but it's available for the uh, professional and when I click alter summary columns, I can show more or less information. So if I want to show growth rate, I don't want to necessarily show uh, the IRS table life expectancy. I don't need to show the client's ages because we know what they are. So I can then click back here, click fit with, and here's what I'm showing. In blue is what I was showing before. In green is what I was showing before. Now I've added something. Uh, I can choose a year of death, and I can, and I, and the, it's telling me the life expectancy. The IRS standard life expectancy expectation based on the entire U.S. population, 2010 census, including smokers and non-smokers, male and female, is 21 years for a 59-year-old woman and 26 years for the second to die of a 59-year-old and a 65-year-old. So that gives me at least some idea of how long we're gonna live. So I can go ahead and model this past the 20th year to the 26th year or whatever year I choose to show what happens after the trust. Then I've got my first year payment. Now, how come my percentage is 9.51%, but my first year payment is 68,264. This is because you have to prorate your first year payment. And a lot of advisors don't realize that. And when you do the calculations, you need to make sure that the that you, you're using a software program that prorates the first year or you will not get an accurate payment percentage necessarily. It may be off by a tiny bit. But this make sure that you draft your charitable remainder trust that the first payment is December 31st, no matter when you start. Okay. This is going to tell me my total payments that my clients are going to receive back. What's going to charity? My income tax savings when I set it up. This is the growth rate that I happen to be using. I can change that up or down. This is the type of charitable remainder trust, and there's no flip. And then here, this is what I think is really neat. I say to the computer, I know that you are telling Uncle Sam that the remainder interest in this charitable remainder trust is worth $100,000. 
but I want to know what it's really worth because the 100,000 is based upon a 75-20 rate of 5.2%, which is an artificially low rate of return, and a life expectancy of 26 years, which is an artificially low life expectancy. They're going to really live longer. So what I've told, what the computer is, is now uh, basing this on is a, a discount rate of 5.2%. But I can, I can come here. And by the way, when you click on, and I'm on the fourth one, when you, when you click on Pro, these vertical blue lines tell you the new features, the additional features. This is my transfer date today or, or recently. And then here's the, here's the client's age. Here's the table 2010 life expectancy. But so that would be uh, age 80, 84. I'm gonna move her life expectancy to 31 years. So that'll give that'll give Marsha till age 90. Let's go to 93. And uh, I can change my growth rate. I can change my income tax rate. I don't need to. And later on, we'll come back to flip NEMCRUD. So in number four, the actual present value of the remainder interest is more like 159,000. So to be, to be truthful to my client, I need to explain that while we're telling the IRS that it's 10% and we're only getting a 10% tax deduction, it's really more like 14%. You know, maybe that's not a big deal, but it's, it's just something that I've um, always wanted to know. All right. It doesn't hurt to do that with a lead trust too, right? Because you could do the same thing and say, this is what the IRS thinks that your kids are gonna get on a lead trust as a remainder beneficiary, but here's what we really think uh, is going to happen. You know, So that, that's another kind of converse approach to what you're doing there. Right. Now, the other things on the calculator, which are also instructive for what else you can do, is I can click here to do a NIMCRUT, which we're gonna cover pretty soon. I can, when I go to Pro Plus, I can change the remainder factor calculation. So go to Pro Plus. When I go to Pro Plus, by clicking Pro Plus at the top, now I've just got, I can move my time value of money illustration. Maybe it's 6%. Maybe the real time value of money is 6%, not 5.2%. Now that remainder interest is worth 141,000. A bit, just a bit more accurate to be truthful with the client. Okay. That's excellent. Yeah. So now the client says, oh, by the way, for each charitable remainder trust, I have a spreadsheet. Now, when I'm in the pro or pro plus, it provides me the details at the top and then a spreadsheet, an exportable spreadsheet. I can show every year, or I can show every other year, or every third year. But if I show every other year, I could also show what when the date of death is and, and the um, end of the term. So that can be, of course, very instructive. And, and then I can export the spreadsheet to Excel. So now I've got an Excel spreadsheet that I can edit and put more information into. So uh, that just explains the spreadsheet. By the way, also, if you want to make PowerPoint slides, all I have to do is click that camera and it captures the image of the top. And then I've got the uh, camera there capturing the image of the bottom. 
And then I've got the camera here capturing the image of the inputs. And they're all here, all these, these pictures, which can then just be popped into a PowerPoint. Or you can, of course, capture the whole screen. So now I want to talk, and we're going to do all this twice because we're going to go through Paul's hypothetical as, as well. But now I want to talk about a, 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 an even fancier charitable remainder trust, and it's called a flip NIMCRUT. And with a flip NIMCRUT, you don't have to take your annual payments. And by the way, I'm going to zero, I'm going to save all this for, to use it later. So I'm going to click Save As. I'm going to have the file name be Paul Casperson. If you want to find Paul's website, by the way, you can just click, just Google Paul Casperson Charitable Tax Planning, and he's got a beautiful website that comes up. Click Save. So now that's on my computer. I can come back to it later. Then I'm going to fi click File New, and now it starts all new with a uh, with our sample um, information. So there's there's my inputs and my uh, spreadsheet. Looking for my spreadsheet. There's there's my spreadsheet. I click on CRUT one. There's my spreadsheet. Now, by the way, I forgot to mention that when you click on timelines and charts, it shows you the charitable remainder trust, what it looks like each year, what goes out, how much is left at the end, and it shows you what the value is over time. It also shows you there's a time log trust logistic, which shows you the original, the, the initial amount. What it's what it's worth, what hap, what it looks like on death, and what it looks like at the end, just for the client. All right. So, sorry, I skipped around. Just forgot to show that. That's great. Yeah. Thanks. So I go back. When you have it's funding a CRT with an asset that is not uh, readily liquid. What are your you you are really as an attorney, you really have to be familiar with the flip provision, right, Alan? Because if you're funding a CRT with uh, with real estate, number one, you're probably going to need to use a unit trust. Number two is you're probably going to need a flip, uh, use a put, incorporate a flip provision that, that the trust will flip and become a standard cut on the sale of that illiquid asset. So using the flip is going to be something that you as an attorney would use very regularly for if you were funding a CRUT with anything other than, you know, cash or publicly traded securities. Right. So I'm putting a, a million dollars into a uh, CRUT and it's a 20 year CRUT. It's going to pay 11.44% a year, 10% uh, deduction. And I don't, I don't want to have a payment for the first few years. So I'm going to click on duplicate, and I'm going to click on flip NIMCRUT. Now, when I click on flip, flip NIMCRUT, it asks me, how many years are you going to defer? Are you going to defer all of the payments or part of the payments? And are you going to use an explosive asset? So I'll ignore explosive asset right now. I'll just assume that the, this million dollar asset is gonna grow by 7.5% a year. And I will assume that the person is gonna retire in year seven. So they don't wanna take anything out until year eight when they'll be in a lower tax bracket. So now what you see here and I, uh, we don't need really age and probabilities to survive or probability of death each year. So I'll just turn those off. I think you know the age. Okay. So now it's a little bit bigger. And what you see is beginning value a million, growth 52,000, payout rate 
11 percent, the annual payment amount, $79,000, actual payment made nothing, makeup payment owed 79,000, cumulative makeup, and then in value. So what happened, what I always thought that this really wouldn't be that helpful because you wouldn't be getting interest on your deferred amount and your deferred amount would be smaller, why would you ever defer? What I didn't realize was I had thought that in year two, the payment would be 11% of 90, of uh, 92,000. I'm sorry, 100,000 minus 79,000. So that mm -hmm. would be 920,000. So I thought the second year, the payment should be based upon 11.44% of, of 920,000 because the trust owes you 80,000, but the regulations do a wonderful favor. The regulations say that it's in year two, 11% of 100, a million 52. So you're getting a percentage of the money that's stored up. So look exactly. at this, the fifth year, you're getting 11% of a million three. The seventh year, you're getting 11% of a million five. So in year eight, the payment that you're getting is $560,000, which is a yes. heck of a lot. That would be the, uh, the makeup payment made. But here's, but, so that's the good news, but here's the bad news. It should make you a makeup payment of 745,000, but it's required to leave that original million in. So waiting until year eight may not be optimum because once it makes the payment and you flip it, then it's only gonna give you 11.44% a year until the end. So, we could just say, this is what it looks like, and click flip fit with, and uh, the end value to charity, based on what I just showed, is 642. So if I do a regular NIMCRUT, charity at the end gets 471. If I do the flip, I get the deferral, but charity gets 642. So the family says, well, uh, what if I retire in year six? Well, oh, let me go back to, to eight. Let's duplicate it. And what if I retire earlier in, let's see here, in year six? Click on six. And now I see that if I wait till year six, charity gets less. They get six, 592. And then I can duplicate it again, hit duplicate and say, well, what about if I flip a year four? Year four, now the charity gets 400, 546,000. But there's a there's another, I hate to use the word tech, I won't say trick, there's another technique. And that is, what if this million dollar asset, and we see all this all, this all the time, is a, a private company, the client typically wants to put it in a month before the sale, three months before the sale. That's a little dicey because of the assignment of income rule. Um, what if what if this asset is going to be worth a million dollars in three years when the company sells, but it's only worth half a million now? So if that's the case, the, the flip pushes more out 
because you only have to leave 500 in. You don't have to leave a million in. And although the first three years your your payment amount was lower, it gets it gets higher after the explosion. Wow. So, so now if I go to eight years, I come back up here and I see that the end value is 291. So, wow. you know, the tax savings is a little bit less. The contribution amount is only 500,000. So the uh, charitable, the, the deduction is a little lower. The income tax savings is not that much different, but the amount that goes to the beneficiaries is much higher. They, they, the present value of the remainder now is 82 versus 167. So that, that's where, and this, this was taught to me by a doctor, a doctor who said, I know all about this stuff. Do a flip NIMCRUT, put it in at a discount. I said, are you crazy? Flip NIMCRUTs don't work that way. And then now finally, I'm able to run the numbers. That is incredible. Because yeah, because what I think that this would help illustrate if I was, you know, own, if I owned a business and I was getting, you know, close to maybe a sale um, is that I, I, I shouldn't be afraid. You know, a lot of people, as you said, want to wait till the last month and then they're going to butt up against assignment of income issues. And if they get tapped for that, that you know, the IRS has not been very friendly with this lately. Um, so why not? set it up two or three years in advance of the sale. Um, so this would give people, I think, more confidence, Alan, to set this up uh, well ahead of the sale. And then number two is, is that it might be more beneficial to you uh, after we flip um, through through this strategy. So it's that's powerful. Yeah. All right, well, so that, I mean, that takes me, one thing I just enjoy about the software is, all the inputs and the outputs is everything I think I need to know about showing this technique to a client. So, and then, uh, by the way, when I, I can click a general explanation, click the th four cluts, cluts, click PowerPoint presentation, put in the client's name, click submit. Oops, reload comes right back to where it was. But it should have, oh well, it didn't. Let me try it one more time. Maybe it's being silly today. So there's my, there's my PowerPoint. So anyway. Cool. All right, so did you wanna run an example? or should we go to minimum distribution rules, whatever you prefer? Well, actually, you may actually want to hear about this example, this case study, uh, to, to consider the minimum distribution rules, because um, I am going to be, I'm, I think this gentleman's jaws can drop when he finds out what his minimum distribution is going to be, because he just retired. So can I walk you through a very simple scenario? We'll, we'll try not, not to overcomplicate it. Okay, that's fine. All right, so um, this is uh, an individual that I haven't personally met, but I've been um, helping um, a, a plan giving professional who has a, a close relationship with this donor. Uh, they live in uh, Boston and um, they, uh, the, the uh, donor, uh, we'll call him Ray, he's 86. And uh, Julia is 78, that's his wife. It's a second marriage. Uh, Ray has two kids from first marriage. Again, Ray's 86, uh, Julia is 78. Um, Ray just retired at age 86. He had his own business and was, was very successful uh, in finance, doing something there in Boston. Um, so he's a resident of Massachusetts, which as you know, Alan has a state, a state tax. Um, their net worth is 80 million and 
it's a pretty simple estate, actually, from what I understand. Um, 20 million is in you anything you would classify non-qualified assets, you know, probably some stocks, bonds, their, uh, their, their house uh, in Massachusetts. 60 million in raised profit sharing plan that has accumulated over his lifetime. Again, the gentleman is 86 years old, he's just retiring. And he um, has not had to take a re required minimum distribution, Alan, um, up until that, up until this time. So yeah, that's a little scary. Um, so he's very charitable. He's very philanthropic. He loves to support um, students that are the first uh, generation to go to college. Um, he 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 could he he is the type of guy that could simply say let's just leave our profit sharing plan to charity but i think he would want to seek counsel from somebody like yourself to say what are some of our our ways our, our methods of mitigating uh both the estate tax and the heavy income tax that our children are going to encounter when they inherit these uh, this profit sharing plan and so you know, I was using the state view, and of course, I'm a novice with the state view. Um, but I was able to model some really interesting things. For one thing, uh, what what you went to right away, the uh, the minimum distribution. Um, so, what is it? It's, Three wow. million nine. Wow, larger than my own IRA. Uh, <laughs> by by a lot. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's going to be that. That's going to be a challenge. And so, one uh, tax attorney uh, who's up and coming now, and he threw out the idea of why not use a rolling plat um, on an annual basis uh, to, you know, you don't, you, you know, he's not going to need that three million dollars. Is there a way to create like a rolling plat, some similar to like a rolling grat, to um to start doing some transfers you know uh, to the to the kids and obviously if this was uh 2021 where our 75 20 rate was one percent it would look very appealing but i would think even today uh for the right person even though the uh we're dealing with 4.8 now 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 you want to go with the lowest 75 20 rate right um yeah. But yeah, uh, that that could be a pretty good idea that this general, uh, this uh, young estate attorney uh, brought up, which is just you know take that RMD and and put that into a, a clat like a rolling clat each year. So, do you want to explain what a clat is for the participants? Sure. Um, well, I'll start by explaining it to say it is probably the most sophisticated and advanced of of all of the. Um, uh, common charitable techniques that are out there, uh, primarily because uh, these can be structured as either grantor or non-grantor, or even some crazy cases, uh, they can be uh, established as a grantor trust for tax per uh, income tax purposes and non-grantor for estate tax purposes. But it's generally, the whole idea here is that you are, the trust is going to pay income to charity, and then the remainder usually to generation two or, or the adult children in most cases. So it's really the, uh, the flip, the, the, the uh, reverse, I should say, of a charitable remainder trust. And it's done primarily for uh, wealthy households that are looking at ways to mitigate future estate taxes by freezing the value of assets today. That's probably a horrible explanation to somebody who's never well, heard of it before. I think it's a good explanation. So, so he puts, so he's going to put. Did we say two million? Sure. I think I think it was up to three million, but he's got to pay taxes on some of that RMD. So. Well, he'll pay that out of his all their money, right? Oh yeah, that's he could, yeah. Yeah. So he puts he puts three million. Let's just see what this comes out to. So he's he's the grantor. He's got a life expectancy of 6.5 years. Um, mm -hmm. He puts three million into the CLAT, no discounts taken. It's going to grow at seven and a half percent. He's going to get two payments, and the two payments are going to be a million six hundred eight thousand each. 
and we can actually improve that. But anyway, we'll we'll play with that in a minute. So he's going to get a million six out the first year, then the second year, and I'm sorry, a million six is going to go to charity the first year and the second year. He's going to deduct the entire three million, but what's left in that trust after the second year is going to be held for his children. And yes. and what that's going to be when you run the numbers for those two years is about two hundred thirty thousand dollars. So yes. So that's let me see if I have to open a column here. As a discount rate for portable gift. Okay. So across the top, the charity is going to get most of the money. But he's going to, but what's left for his children is going to be a pretty nice chunk in, in two years. So that makes sense because there's no gift consider is considered to be made, but it's about 222. Yes, and you've, you've basically zeroed that out, right? I mean, it's. Um, yeah. 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 So, um, so that, yeah, that makes good sense. Now, I just want to point out on, he's 86. So let, let's say we do a five-year CLAT, and I'll just duplicate this. And if we do a five-year CLAT, well, actually, before I do that, I just want to point out that with a charitable lead annuity trust, you don't have to make equal annual payments, you can make uh, payments that are either level or it's very safe to increase them by 20% a year. So more stays in the clat longer. Like and a you, can do a shark fund. you can do a shark fund. So if we do a 20 year, 20% 20 increase, then the expected remainder is goes up a little bit. So we would at least increase by 20%. Or if we do shark fin, where the vast majority come of it comes out in the second year, I'll go ahead and click duplicate and I'll go back to uh, shark fin. When I click on shark fin, you get a little shark fin there. And <laughs> now what's left for his children is 300. So hey. yeah, that's not bad. So in other words, you get you get a whole through you get a whole three million dollar tax deduction, but you sneak a little bit out to your children that way. Now, if he, right. does, if he does a five year clat, and I'll hit duplicate again. If he does a five year clat, um, I'm sorry, go back to term of clat, five years, and uh, let's take the take something safer, twenty percent increasing per year um, you don't need any remainder value now if he, he's got to live the five years for this thing to work but if he lives the five years now the savings go up dramatically from 300 to 483 i'm not sure that that's that much better because if he's going to reclad it well no that way that is a lot better that's what's left for his descendants out of that three million. Now next year he can do another three, the following year another three. But the, if he'll live the five years, the, the children get another 181,000. But the other thing is if you go with a five-year CLAT, I'll go to CLAT number five. If you go with a five-year CLAT, you could put the three million in an LLC, have him give the 99% LLC interest and take, let's just say, a 10%, a 15% discount. Well, 10%, very conservative, you know, certainly defendable. Mm -hmm. Now that's that thing goes from 481 to a million forty. That's impressive. So I like the idea of the one-year clat, and I'm not showing what he would do when he get, but he, uh, but it might be better. We can run the numbers and see what's better. And this is just one year's minimum distribution, you know, right here. Right. right. So, yeah, that's that's excellent. Um, and you know, 
again, I, you know, in the interest of time, I don't know how much time we'll have, Alan, but you could, you know, there are so many amazing tools in a state view where you can, um, you know, make this the bigger picture of their entire estate. <clears throat> this is just obviously one element of it, but um, if they were to, you know, simply leave the whole uh, uh, profit sharing plan to the, the three charities that um, that Ray is interested in, um, you could he could you can visually he can visually see which is so important for your clients visually see the the mitigation of both the federal estate tax and of the Massachusetts estate tax, and so there's just so many incredible things. That you can do in a state view. This is just, you know, one way you could test some concepts of how to address this large minimum distribution that he's going to encounter now on an annual basis. Right. That's right. So here, so here's the fifth clock crack um, showing 5.2, one life. Actually, this is not the right PowerPoint. But anyway. So that so that's that's the clap. Let's just um, let's just talk about a couple other things that we can use for charity. Sure. And um, we've we've covered the clap. We've covered the charitable remainder unit trust. You did just the RMD clap. calculator. Yep, we did the RMD calculator. Let's just mention there's something called a charitable remainder annuity trust, and it's very similar to a CRUT, but the annual payment. Once it's determined, the annual payment never changes. So yes. you you never have to go back and say, what's it worth? I have to value it every year. Is it going up? It's going down. I'm so afraid if it goes down, I won't be able to, to continue to live. Here you lock in a $50,000 a year payment rate, and that's what you get, whether all the assets are spent or not. Typically, there's more for charity than you expected, so that's the charitable. A remainder um, annuity trust, and then we have the life estate remainder interest. Do you want to walk through that, Paul, in the conversation sure. that you have when somebody wants to consider giving a remainder interest in their home or farm? Yes, this this happens regularly over my career. I've done a number of these, and where you you typically want to look to for these for your clients are uh, vacate like their second home. Um, a lot of uh, donors are definitely interested in using their, their second home for something like this. They plan to keep it for the rest of their life or for farmland. Farmland is incredibly powerful for retained life estate. So basically the concept, hence the name retained life estate, I'm deeding my real property to the charity, but subject to a retained life estate that usually it's for me and my spouse. Um, I also sign an agreement called an MIT agreement, which is, stands for maintenance, insurance, and taxes, that I agree that I will um, I will be responsible for it during my life. So that gives the charity some peace of mind since they're now in the title chain. Um, and that's it. So what? why would a donor do this? Why not just leave it in their will? Because it's an irrevocable gift and as such, you, the donor would qualify for a charitable income tax deduction, which um, Alan's tool can model. So if I was age 70 or you know what, whatever age that you want to use there, Alan, um, I, I could figure out what my deduction is. Now, similarly to charitable lead trusts, we want the lowest 75-20 rate that we can possibly use, which as Alan said, it's either the current month or the two previous months that you can use. And so in that case, you uh, would wanna use the, the lowest 75-20 rate to produce the highest charitable income tax deduction. So it's a great uh, planning tool for your donors who have um, personal real estate and for uh, they have a farm or a ranch. Okay, so let's just run the numbers. For a 70-year-old, um, click to see results, one life, the uh, remainder interest is worth 4.9399%. So 
So what does that mean if it's a million dollar home or farm? About a half a million dollar deduction, right? Right. So, That's right. Yeah. It's nothing to sneeze at, um, for sure. And it's it's very attractive. If you got a donor who's uh, got a taxable event coming, they own some real estate free and clear, that they're comfortable uh, with this type of a gift. It's a it's a great uh, great strategy. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll take you even one one further, Alan. Um, at Charitable Solutions, we uh, have worked. With, I worked with a very large national charity with one of their donors that had a home in uh, Santa. Mo I think it was Santa Monica, eight million dollar home. She didn't want to do a reverse mortgage, so what she did is she donated the retained life estate, but the 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 value, the present value of the remainder was then going to be used to set up a charitable gift annuity. So uh, we'll call her Mrs. Smith, 84 years old. She now gets income from the charity and still lives in her home for the rest of her life. Uh, the nickname for that in our industry is the charitable reverse mortgage. It's a very risky um, uh, agreement to enter into for any charity, but if you're a large enough charity, you could you could do something like that so that's taking it even one step further alan that's really neat how often does the person then later donate the life estate and get a second deduction at that time um you know i i've only seen that a couple times in my career and it's usually because the donor is knows they're going into skilled nursing and you know they're not going to be able to move back home and so they're like, let's just let's just get this done, and we'll just deed deed it now. And of course, at that time, uh, if they decided they didn't want the life estate anymore, they would get a, an additional deduction. Right. So I show a seventy-year-old alone, the deduction is going to be forty-nine point four percent. The life, the joint life of a seventy-year-old and a sixty-five-year-old, uh, the life expectancy is certainly longer. 50, 22 years versus 15 years, therefore the deduction is lower. But they'll have the yeah. benefit of the saved income tax for a longer period of time if they yes. reinvest it, and their greedy children will never be able to get title to that home. It's going to the charity. Right. They won't so, they won't argue over that that vacation, the second home. They won't have to argue about it or worry about it at all. Yeah, let's get off tax topic and let me just ask you. How often have you seen, as the client gets older and more frail, the children kill the deal on the charitable contribution? Um, more times than I care to, uh, and it's usually because I, I put a lot of the blame, in some cases, on the donors because they did not have these conversations with their kids, you know, earlier, and they then the kids find out you know, after the plan's been put in place, there's some resistance and uh, it can get, it can definitely get ugly. And you know what the charity's position is 99 times out of 100, Alan, is we're not fighting. We're not fighting if it ever came to that. Um, you can Google a number of universities, especially, um, the, well, one in particular, um, you know, was going to sue a donor's estate and the PR uh, was so bad for the university that they just dropped the case. So yeah. that's usually, you know, Terry's position. Well, the thing is, you know, at age 65, where I am, if I want a million dollars to set up a chair somewhere when I die, I probably should put it into a CLAT or a charitable remainder trust to make sure that my kids can't decide, can't convince me to the uh, to the contrary in 20 years or my next wife who knows who it would be so locking yes. it in locking it in can be a really good idea i can't um, tell you how many cases for crts have been i don't like my daughter-in-law or my son-in-law so the uh, crt is going to pay income to my son for the rest of his life but when he dies that you know that that trust is going to terminate and go to charity so you can be married to that man or woman and i'm not going to like them but i'm not going to let my wealth go to them if you predecease them 
Right. So there's a great use case for CRTs right there. I want to I want to mention. And I'm going to go to my staging site, by the way. So this is where we work on things that have not have been released to everybody. But I, I just wanted to mention the Monte Carlo calculator because what it does is it says, look, if you have a uh, 60, 40 or portfolio of stocks and bonds, you're going to keep it invested for 30 years. Then if you look at the history of the stock market and you roll the dice 10,000 times, there's about a 50% chance that it'll be uh, more or less than 8.81%. That's the most common result, 8.81%. There's a 10% chance that it'll be 6.49%. There's a 10% chance that it'll be 11%. So it's good to show clients, look, I can't, I ran the numbers on 7.5, but they may be a lot bigger or they may be smaller. But one thing it allows you to also do is show me the worst 1%. Because you know what? If you think about it, there's just as much chance that you'll get the worst 1% as there is that you'll get the 50%. So uh, at the one percentile, you'll get a 4% rate of return, which I guess is comforting. Now, yes. when I click on this and I go to a 20-year rate of return or a 10-year, let's say uh, yeah, 15 years, now it's a, it's a slightly different situation but it's not a bad idea just to make sure clients know that um, stocks are pretty safe compared to bonds because the rate of return so if i go uh, duplicate again and i go to 85 15 portfolio the rates of return are actually more likely to be higher, certainly going to have a better inflation hedge. But your worst result, your bottom 1% result is lower. So, and then maybe we can just have some fun and show the top 1% result. 99th percentile, 18.23% is what it is. Nice what it could be. So that's that's just one of the new calculators I wanted to show you. We're going to add that custom percentile both here and at the beginning so you can show the, the lowest 1% or the lowest 5%. And then we're also going to allow you to say how much is coming out a year, how much is going in a year, so that the client can get a more realistic view. But it's interesting, every time I click this, it's doing 10,000 dice rolls to get to the next number, which yeah. is uh, pretty cool. And then we've got the Nest calculator, which can help a client decide if they're going to run out of assets or not. So for every expense, we have a column on a spreadsheet. How much for the wedding? How much for your house? How much for your uh, retirement? How much life insurance do you need? And then you can go ahead and add your charitable pledges. So you can go down here and say one-time expense. Uh, well, I'd like to give my church a million dollars or $500,000. How does that impact my retirement? Well, if you're gonna do that, then you can still retire in time. So, you know, those are the types of things, Paul, that I, I hope that event that I know that the typical charitable calculators don't have the personal budgeting, the federal estate tax impact, uh, and the Monte Carlo. So hopefully that'll be of use to a lot of your colleagues. Uh, I know it'll be a lot of use to colleagues. Um, anyone that's going to have an advanced conversation with a uh, with a mega donor 
really needs to have a tool like this to be uh, comprehensive. Of course, you know, we want a philanthropic advisor to collaborate with the other advisors. You're not just doing this in a vacuum. But, you know, if you're just trying to have some initial conversations with this mega donor um, and you want to, you know, uh, describe some of these techniques without using this tool, good luck. Because, you know, when Alan asked me to describe a clap, imagine me doing that on the spot with a, with a client without a visual. It's just really hard to do. And so I think that's, you know, going to be one of the most important um, uh, benefits of, of, a, of a state view is just that people can visually, the light bulb is going to go on, you know, it's going to go on for your clients when they see the scenarios that you're walking through with them. Now, I went to the news, I, I clicked on news. When you click on news there, you can pick uh, a, a, from a number of news feeds. So now I can look at a, a number of news feeds at the same time. I wanted to mention on the 19th, the Treasury Department issued new questions and answers on the Corporate Transparency Act, and it's very, very lenient on trusts. Mm -hmm. It really shows, I don't think they want the trust protectors. I, I don't think they want the alternate trustee. Um, I'm not even sure the swap power that a grantor holds to exchange trust assets with assets of equal value. So that, that was a nice thing. They also mentioned though, that the $500 penalty is inflex, it indexed with inflation from 2020. So it's really a $585 penalty now yeah. for late compliance with the, uh, with the, with the BOA. I also want to mention that the IRS's uh, recent dirty dozen list, and this is, by the way, the tax advisor is a great little publication. Fantastic website. Yeah. You cannot put assets in a charitable remainder trust and then have the charitable remainder trust buy an annuity and then expect the annuity payments coming back out to you to be income tax free. And that's pretty clear under the tax law. There was a, there was a, court case about two years ago about a farmer who tried to do that with his crops. The cool thing, Paul, was that the judge allowed the income tax deduction for the crops to go into the charitable remainder trust, and the judge allowed the tax deferral for the crops, but he said the annuity part, where the, where the proceeds of the sale went into the annuity, didn't work. So the IRS just put that on the dirty dozen list, which means if you do that, you and your tax preparer are in deep doo-doo. Yes, that's it's a dumb idea. It's a dumb idea. All right, now well, CRT on. can own a life insurance policy. That that's an, another whole interesting topic. But anyway, much different from the annuity uh, structure that you just described. Yeah. So um, let me see if there's any questions here. Okay, is is Paul available for consultations, and how does that work? I wrote that one, Alan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, of course. Uh, EstateGiftPlanning.com. Just send me an email or set up some time on my calendar anytime. I'd be delighted to speak with you. Okay. Second question. You should definitely have a part two. Paul's got a lot of great things to share. I particularly love hypotheticals. You guys should just do hypotheticals for an hour sometime. <laughs> That's good. All right, well, thanks Great. to everybody for allowing us to share this time with you. Thanks for those of you who are still here, a little bit over 50% of everybody stayed longer, showing that you're in it for the planning and not only for the continuing education credit. Paul, you walk your talk, you're a great example. You've, you've, you've been in a big organization, you've been in a number of organizations, now you're doing your own thing for a, for a lot of organizations. You've put a million two, 1.2 billion on the books for one organization going to charity. I think that's really notable. My hat's off to you. Well, ditto in, in all of the work that you do. And it was a pleasure to join you today. I hope we can do it again in the future when we find some interesting things to talk about, Alan. All right, perfect. Have a great day. Take care, everybody. Okay, thank you, everyone.